because uh, she she does like the the tithing counting stuff because right now we're we're sharing one car so my tesla is still uh, in the shop um you know and i don't have to it takes them like two hours to count so i don't have to sit around and wait around so i i attend on zoom sometimes but um i'm there the rest of the time okay Yeah, I've started the recording. Okay, let's keep uh, trucking here. Uh, I just want to revisit something from uh, the end of class uh, last time. A uh, uh, question came up about, uh, you know, how am I coming up with these ands and ors and uh, uh, that kind of jazz? Well, first of all, I want to kind of just roll back to the idea that, remember, the job of our programming languages is to allow us to solve problems the way human beings already solve problems. All right. So this isn't some like new memorization type thing. Is there a question? Yeah, I was exactly like the Oh, excuse me. I'll, I'll talk about it here in a second. Um, so anyways, the, the programming languages, they're trying to allow us to solve problems the way we already solve problems. So just the, so this isn't something you need to like memorize these charts this just kind of puts it into this formal thing called truth tables in our normal daily lives we use the phrase or you know like you know do you want to go to the movies or maybe for a walk something like that so the programming language version of this allows us to uh capture that kind of logic right um uh, same thing with an and exclusive or becomes a little bit, uh, you know, so like, let's actually use that example I just used. Do you want to go to the movie or go for a walk? A reasonable answer to that might be yes, right? Because you might say, yeah, let's do both of those things. Maybe let's walk to the movies, <laughs> something like that. Where an exclusive or says one or the other, but not both. So I might say, do you want to go to the movies? Exclusive or go for a walk now you're saying look you pick one of those two right or none but at most one of the options all right um so uh that's what these guys are trying to allow us to capture is that concept okay um so having said that uh try not to make these overly complicated from like a oh i need to memorize some you know, zero and one type thing. We're just mimicking something that we're already naturally doing in our daily lives. Just when we start dragging it towards computer programming, things get a little more intimidating in our mind and stuff. Okay. So remember, the whole point of this is this idea of our Boolean expressions. Uh, these guys here. Where are we at? Boolean expression. So it's any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false. The point of these expressions is to allow us to formulate things involving questions. And today we're going to look at loops where we want to keep repeating something over and over and over again as long as some condition remains true. Okay. But try to remember all these things in the context of. We're just trying to mimic what we already do in normal human life. Okay. It just looks scarier when we're trying to do it in code. All right. So having said that, just as a quick reminder here, we looked at our, we talked about our if statements uh, last time where the official syntax for an if statement is if open parenthesis some boolean expression that is something that follows the rules follows the the thing that it's any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false no matter how scary it might look a whole bunch of things chained together with ands and ors and xors whatever it ultimately boils down to a single value of true or false okay now with that in mind associated with this if i say if this is true do this thing those curly braces i talked about last time are not absolutely required 
although I would say they're never incorrect. And I strongly encourage you to always put them because technically you have a single statement that is, a, that is I'm going to do this if and only if this guy boils down to true. Well, one of my options for a true statement is something called a block statement, which is the opening and closing curly brace, which allows me to hold a whole bunch of statements. So typically we're gonna do more than just a single thing following an if statement, which is why it's gonna be very common anyways that you're gonna be required to put the opening and closing curly braces. What I'm saying is, is even if you're only going to do a single thing, it's not gonna hurt to put the opening and closing curly braces, but they are not actually technically part of the formal syntax for an if statement. An if statement just requires that you have a true statement following your if Boolean expression. That's just very commonly going to be an opening and closing parenthesis with a bunch of statements inside of it. All right, so we looked at some of our Boolean operators. These things are things that you're probably already very familiar with, the whole less than, less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, yada, yada, yada. Um, the one little caveat that we should kind of throw in the back of our mind as a, you know, be careful is this double equal sign. The double equal sign allows us to test for equivalence among primitive types. So I can say, is this integer the same value as some other integer? Okay. So the kicker there is, is I'm talking about primitive types so that we've only seen primitive types at this point. Um, but once we get to object types, that double equal sign isn't going to quite do what many of us might expect it to do. All right, so and we'll cover that when we get to it, but primitive type values, these are going to be our, you know, byte short, int long, char, float double, uh, and Boolean. All right, it allows us to test for equivalence among things that are of those types. All right, then the not equals the exclamation point equal sign. But this double equal sign is for equivalence. The single equal sign is to assign a value to a variable. All right, so don't get confused between those two. We also then have our logical Boolean operators. This is that ability for us to chain uh, ands and ors together. All right, so the, out of this list, the things we're gonna see pretty often is this guy right here, the double ampersand, this allows us to say and, and this guy right here, the double uh, vertical pipe, this says, uh, this is how we say or in any C-based language. And a high, 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 high majority of time, we're gonna be formulating our Boolean expressions using those two things if we need to make a more complex Boolean expression. You will hardly ever see a single ampersand or a single vertical pipe um, unless it's something very, very mathy or a syntax error. <laughs> One of those two. We did look last time at bitwise operations and we saw why you might get a weird answer out of it. And like I said, I'm not testing you over that. You won't have some sort of trick question on the exam where I you know, make something look like a Boolean expression, but actually it's a math expression with a bitwise operator. You don't have to worry about that. I'm never trying to trick you, but I want you to be aware of it because you might accidentally make a mistake on when you're working on your homework assignments at some point where you forget to put a double ampersand and instead of put a single ampersand and you get a weird result. It's because it's performing a bitwise Boolean operation at the binary version of two numbers. All right, similarly, and this came up uh, a couple minutes ago, I answered it already, but I'll say it again. You will rarely see an exclusive or um, use this operator. Uh, you could build exclusive ors using ands and ors, but the concept of exclusive or, some people refer to it as zor or xor, pronounce it however you want, but exclusive or is just like an or, except it's only true when there's exactly one true value on either side okay so zero exclusive or one is true one exclusive or zero is true 
otherwise it's false. So if both sides are true, exclusive or for true or true, true or true is false. They both can't be true. All right, but what I'm telling you is, is that in practice, in programming practice, it's gonna be pretty rare for you to be working with that. Zors are, are much more common in building computer hardware. You buy these, uh, um, you know, the chips, you buy these chips and you buy various gates. So there is a, a hardware gate called an OR gate or an, and an AND gate. The ones that are uh, very common are NAND gates. That is not AND. There's also NOR gates. There's also ZOR gates. What's nice about the NAND gate is you can use that single gate to produce all the other gates. So it's like a universal gate. So you take a company like uh, Apple, they might buy a bazillion of those gates and then use it to produce all their stuff because if they have that many, they can probably get the price per thing way down. But today everything's 3D printed uh, circuit boards. So it's, uh, or printed circuit boards rather. Um, so we don't even have the physical gates with soldering irons really anymore, but that's where you'd see these guys more often in kind of computer engineering type applications, not in uh, programming type stuff. Go ahead. And an X, well, an, in, an inclusive and? I see what you're saying. If both are false, you want it to fire as true? Is that a thing? Well, that would be a, a NAND, a not AND, but then that doesn't get you. So a not AND or an AND, a not AND ZOR, an AND would accomplish what you're trying, what you're trying to, actually no, just a not AND or a ZOR would get you what you want. So yes, but by stringing other things together, we don't have a, a in programming, we don't have a flat operator for accomplishing that. But again, for from a beginning programmer mentality, I know I'm throwing kind of a lot of details at you. Really, what I'm giving you is extraneous information. I want to I try to focus you in on the things that are really important in your world. Okay, so your world right now is right there. Those two guys, ands and ors. You'll be building all your Boolean expressions out of those or less, because a lot of your Boolean expressions aren't going to involve ands and ors. It's just going to be keep doing like today. We're going to look at some numerical uh, for loops, and we're going to say keep doing something as long as this value is less than ten, not less than ten and five other things. It's I'm going to count from zero to ten and do something. All right. So most of our Boolean expressions are fairly simple uh, thingies. All right. So loops. So we go back to that original slide, how do human beings solve problems? We remember stuff, we ask questions and repetition. So we've already learned how to remember stuff through variables. We've already learned how to ask questions last class through conditionals, if statements. Now we're gonna learn how to do some repetition. And once we have those three things, we can now start solving real problems using our languages without being overly limited. Well, yeah, so we're going to look at it. We're going to look at them here. So um, in C, we have three common loops. We have a while loop, we have a for loop, and we have a do while loop. And we're going to kind of pigeonhole these guys into kind of what they are intended for, but it's going to fall into a similar category to what we talked about a few minutes ago, where you could accomplish anything involving loops with any of these three loops with some additional effort of maybe a, a conditional or something like that, okay? But each of these loops lend themselves to a certain kind of problem. So a, a while loop lends itself to problems where we do not know how many times 
we need to repeat. Good example is uh, when you have some, well, this is less common today, but you know, old computer programs, you know, click, you know, to press enter to continue, something like that. How long is it going to be until they have to press continue? Have they hit the button yet? 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 That's a while loop. All right. We don't actually know when it's going to end, but we're going to keep repeating something as long as some condition is true. A for loop lends itself to counting problems or problems where we do know how many times we want to repeat. So if I say I want to do something 10 times, a for loop is going to allow me to do that. It, it lends itself to solving that kind of problem. We'll look at a while loop and a for loop today that both accomplish that same problem. Um, and we'll talk about kind of the caveats of them a little bit. Uh, but in general, um, for loops are counting problems, while loops are, let's just say, non counting problems. And both of those loops fall into the category of, of pre-check loops. Okay, so both a while loop and a for loop are pre-check loops, which means we look at the result of the Boolean expression before we execute the body of the loop even once. Okay. So if I say, um, uh, while it's not raining, I'm going to step outside. I will ask the question, is it raining first? Or is it not raining first before I actually step outside? I don't step outside and then wonder whether it's raining. Okay. So pre-check loops allow us to ask a question beforehand and then only conditionally do what's inside the loop even that very first time so we ask the question first pre-check we'll know the answer before we do anything the first time as opposed to post check loops so these pre-check loops we evaluate the boolean expression first and then execute the body the first time post check loops execute the body at least once and then evaluate the boolean expression and potentially execute the body again so do while loops are one of these kinds so these guys lend themselves to problems where we need to do something at least one time now what's interesting about this is that in the wild, if you're looking at code or you're writing code, your least commonly used loop is going to be a do while loop. Okay, if you looked at 100 computer programs, you're probably going to find 99 of them that don't have a do while loop in them. But what's interesting is, is one of our most common problems that we solve that we all have computer software that solves on a daily basis involves this idea of something happening at least once even though our computers remember our usernames and passwords for us and we don't actually do this when we sit down to check our email or do something like that we know that we're having to send our username and password to the system at least one time to authenticate us right and then it only asks us to type in a better username and password if we screwed up the first time so authentication is something that we all do multiple times every single day even though it's become so automated we don't think about it right we were put out when we have to put our, our password in <laughs> or something like that. Um, 
but we do are we are providing that information at least one time um, in order to accomplish what uh, uh, we're trying to accomplish. And that's where a post check type loop like a do while loop might come in handy. Okay, do this stuff while they've put in a bad password. So we'll ask them for the username and password once, then say, did you enter it right? If not, we'll ask them again. Did you enter it right this time? If not, ask them again, so on and so forth. But we're still going to ask them for that username and password the very first time. So do while loops lend themselves to those kinds of problems, even though I'm telling you, you will rarely see them in the wild. You will see for loops a lot. You will see while loops less commonly, but certainly more often than do while loops. So what does that tell us? It tells us that most of the problems that we're solving in when we're writing software is counting problems. Do something some number of times. Do this a hundred times, do this a thousand times, whatever it is. Sometimes we'll say, do this until something happens. I'm going to go for a walk until it starts raining. So what's the body of that loop? Taking a step, then another step, then another step. We're going to keep repeating steps outside over and over and over again until it starts pouring. And then we're going to stop walking. And then hopefully what comes the code after that gets us indoors or open umbrella or you know whatever whatever it might be. All right. So those are our three different kinds of loops. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at a while loop first. So while loop, the syntax for a while loop is almost identical to an if statement uh, without the else, with the exception that we say the word while instead of the word if. So it's while Boolean expression, true statement. And the same thing holds true. It doesn't have to be an opening and closing curly brace, but it's never gonna be wrong for it to be an opening and closing curly brace. And what happens here is, I'll just put a little comment here. This statement will keep executing as long as the Boolean expression above remains true. That is different than an if statement, which only does something once. If this is true, do this, otherwise continue on with life. So if statements allow us to ask a question and perform a single action or a single group of actions one time, whereas a while loop allows us to ask a question and conditionally do some stuff and then ask that question again, potentially doing that stuff again and again and again and again. That's what makes it a loop instead of a conditional instead of an if statement. Go ahead. Is there a way to have it for that, like, um, it just keeps going until it gets true? Like, if I can't do it again, like, You would put a not in front of your, yeah, and if you would, you would formulate your Boolean expression in such a way to accomplish what you want. You know, I want to keep doing something as long as something is not the case. Yeah. Is there, like, a specific Not by default. Yeah, it's just going to be the speed of your processor. So what he's asking is, is, is there, so if we're thinking about like game programming, most of your game programming tools, like uh, um, the tool that I use in some classes is called Unity. And built into that is something called the game loop, which occurs, um, the default one occurs every frame per second. So when you have your video game playing and, you know, it's running at 60 frames a second or 100 frames a second, there are things that are occurring per frame on the screen. Um, so with that in mind, depending on the speed of your graphics card, that's going to give you some sort of timing. Same thing is kind of true here, except the speed that we're measuring against is the speed of your processor. How many instructions per second can my processor do, uh, which is a lot. 
of them, <laughs> okay? Uh, and because we don't have a visual component of that, uh, it's really fast. Because remember, even though you might have a really expensive $2,000 graphics card in your computer, um, it still has to ultimately get crap on the screen. And chances are your limiting factor is how fast your monitor is, right? You might have a graphics card that can put stuff out on the screen at 400 frames per second for like Microsoft Word, let's say, probably, high, probably higher than that. But, you know, but even if you have a gaming monitor running at 240 hertz, your high-end gaming monitor can only show 240 individual picture, pictures per second. That means the speed of something is going to be um, 200, you know, 240 divided, well, 60 divided by 240. That's the, the speed at which it's happening. But it does take time for that monitor to actually display a whole bunch of colored pixels. How much time? 60 divided by 20, 240 for doing a single display. If we're not having to display stuff and we're just talking about like mathy stuff happening at the processor, way faster than that. So for all intents and purposes, the time it takes to run through a while loop, unless there's something in the loop that takes more time, is effectively instantaneous from a human being's perspective. Okay, and I'll actually try to show that to you today. In fact, let's let's look at that now with an example. All right. Um, open here. And I'm going to go ahead. We're going to use. We've been using IO Stream, right? The font big enough? We're good. We can see it. All right. Actually, let me. Can you still see it? Okay. Because right. I'm going to need a little bit more space then. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a variable here called count. I'm going to do something some number of times. I'm going to count the number of times I'm going to do it. And I'm going to say while count is less than 10. I'll do a C out count. And then I'll say count is assign the value, the single equal sign, of whatever count currently is plus one. All right, so what am I doing? I'm defining a variable, I'm remembering something called count. I'm starting it equal to starting it off equal to zero. Then I'm asking the question, while the current value of count is less than 10, then I want to do this stuff. So count starts off at zero. Is zero less than 10? It is. Print out zero. Now count is going to be equal to whatever it's currently equal to, which is zero plus one. So now count is one. Spin back up. Is one less than 10? Yes. Print out a one. One becomes two. Two less than 10? Yes. Print out a two. Two becomes three. Yada, yada, yada. Is 10 less than 10? not less than it so we will fall past the end of this while loop and we can say uh you know while loop over or something like that you can do less than or equal to and then it would go through one more time yeah all right so if i run this this is going to print out zero through nine onto the screen and then while loop over so this code right here We'll go through and run this line of code 10 total times, starting with zero, going all up, go all the way up to, but not including a 10. Oh, I got to choose my language up here. There's my zero through nine, and then while loop over. All right, questions about what I'm doing right there? All right, 
So now we're going to get to your point about speed. I'm going to change this to a million. I didn't ask you. My watch didn't understand it, apparently. All right, so we're going to do this a million times now. And each time through, we are printing something to the screen. And what I'm telling you is displaying something to the screen is expensive. Even though it's just text out to the screen, the way this works with our CPU, our CPU does a lot of math stuff. It's really, really good at doing math. But as soon as you start involving things like the monitor and stuff like that, the CPU will do its math. It'll say count equals count plus one. It'll loop back up. It'll ask that Boolean expression. But then as soon as it gets to that line where it has to display something, the CPU is going to say, okay, my work is temporarily done. I'm going to hand this off to the operating system to go do its job of actually getting something put out onto the screen, which involves the frame buffer and all this other stuff, things that aren't the CPU, things that take time. And then that's going to happen. And then that, this running process, this program is going to have to get back in line to wait for his turn to get back onto the CPU. Okay, if you think of the CPU like a carnival ride, you know, if you get on the, the, the ride and you do one line of code and then all of a sudden you're done with what you can do. So even though the CPU is willing to give you more time on the ride, you jump off to go do something else. In this case, IO, you then have to get back in line and wait for the ride to be available yet again. Those are called context switches. If you take the operating systems class, context switching is expensive. Sometimes context switching happens because your time is up on the CPU, maybe you get three milliseconds on the CPU. Well, a lot, of, a lot can happen in three milliseconds when you're thinking about how fast your processor is. But if you step onto the CPU and you only take um, 0.2 nanoseconds of time to do one little thing before you now need to do IO, you got onto the CPU, you unpacked your bags, you did one thing only to then be forced to repack your bags and jump ship to go do IO, then go get back in line. You're gonna be spending more time unpacking bags on the CPU and getting out of the CPU and waiting for IO and then waiting to get back onto the CPU, then you'll use actually doing stuff. And you're gonna see here that this program will take noticeable time to run. Clearly taking time to run, right? All right, you know, we could probably extrapolate. This will probably be done in a couple minutes, something like that. Same thing would be true local. I mean, you, maybe it would run a little faster, but you, you're going to see the same thing. Now, interesting enough, can I, oh, I can kill it here. All right. Now I'm going to make one little change here. I'm not going to display it. I'll go ahead and prove that I did, in fact, change count. I'll display it a single time after that loop is done. And I'll run that same code again. Let me see how quickly we got, there, got our answer. Processors are really, really, really fast at doing math. That second you have to start not using your time very wisely on the CPU, jumping off and having to do IO, then getting back in line for the CPU, now we notice the time. So pretty simple example to see what things take time on our computers and what things don't. Make sense? Now, the reality is, is we probably would not very commonly say, let's do something a million times and print the results all million times. That was a forced example because we were. Um, because the very last time through, we added one to it. Then we failed this while loop. And then we printed out that final value. Okay. So, questions about this little experiment we just did, kind of the last five minutes or so? 
kind of an interesting experiment showing what takes time on our computers versus what things happen. I mean, if, if you had a low end by today's standard processor, versus a maximum speed high-end processor you put onto a server or something like that this program would run in from a human's perspective the same amount of time right now processors are really fast and if you're just doing mathy stuff like this done all right um and io is really slow <laughs> so that's going to add noticeable delays to your uh, computer programs so then the question is, is why get that faster? Uh, why, why get that more expensive processor if seemingly the budget pleaser entry level processor is so fast that I'm telling you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and um, uh, the most expensive processor on the market for running this program. Human being wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They would both of them would run instantaneously. So why go and spend the extra money on that more expensive, presumably better processor? Is it bragging rights? You know, kind of like buying a car with a V12 in it that gets a half a mile per gallon. Yeah, it's, all I do is drive into residential areas at 15 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right the reality is it's it's not for the average case it's for the um when you're pushing that processor to do more when you have that v12 high performance race car and you're in a situation where you're on an open straightaway needing to go really fast or at least wanting to go really fast okay you're gonna beat the honda civic right Okay, in that scenario, both of them are going to drag you through the neighborhood at, <laughs> at the same uh, same rate. Same thing's true with our computer processors. The lowest, the slowest processor is going to run this program from our perspective just as fast as the absolute fastest processor all day long. But now when you get something like one of these video games running that's using up a pretty high percentage of your processor during a, a good portion of that game, and you have processors with more and more cores where more and more things can happen simultaneously. Now you're going to start feeling that power of that of that sports car with the V12, as opposed to your M1 processor that is a great processor, but you probably don't want to put it in your gaming computer. Make some sense? So I like to make these uh, examples that take us back to what real life is like because computers are the same thing. They just seem more complicated. All right. So let me bump this back down to a 10. We'll go ahead and put our little print statement back out here. And we'll see this happening 10 times. Now, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna copy that statement and I'm going to print one last time after that while loop's done. And we should see that count actually does become a 10, to your point, right? We did make it one larger the last time through. Then we spun back up. We asked this question, is 10 less than 10? It is not. So we will not execute the body of this again, but we drop through and hit this line, printing out the value of count. But now, couldn't that the output then while count is equal or uh, greater than or equal to 10? Less than or equal to 10? Yeah. This guy, yeah, because now I'll get an 11 out at the end. Yeah. Because it still went through one more time. Yeah. But you could then delete the, uh, the, the background. Well, I'm, but I, I'm not worried about the output here. I, I'm kind of proving that we still have access to yeah. the value of count after yeah. this loop is done. Okay. All right, so I'm going to now show a for loop. We're going to write the same logic using a for loop. Let me show you the syntax for a for loop. For loop takes a lot of those parts 
Because remember, in a previous slide, I said for loops lend themselves to counting type problems. Would you agree that this is a counting type problem that I just did with a while loop? All right, so I used a while loop here for a problem that really lends itself to a for loop. Fine, no harm, no foul. In fact, that it would actually be difficult for me to uh, um, show an example of a problem that really lends itself to a while loop, knowing using only what we know how to do right now. That would be a kind of a difficult uh, thing for us to, to do. So we'll stick with the counting problems right now just to see the differences. All right, so if I look at this while loop and I think about what are the various pieces that are involved here? One piece is, is I'm using a counter, some kind of integer to do something some number of times. So I'm keeping track of a current number. I have a Boolean expression and inside the loop, I'm changing the value of that number. Make sense? Those are the three things that are gonna be kind of common in all counting type loops. Create a counter, ask a question, do some stuff, change my counter. Okay, so for loops, which lend themselves to those kinds of problems, are going to have those pieces built into it. So it's for define counter semicolon boolean expression semicolon change counter true statement same thing as before it'll probably be opening closing curly braces because you're probably doing more than one thing so I'll always put opening and closing curly braces no I mean because there is no else to a four a four says do this until it's false, then continue on with life. We're not asking a question. We're not saying do this or do this. The or to this guy, the else would just be the code that comes after it. So let's go ahead and write, I'm gonna say for int count two is equal to zero. Keep going as long as count two is less than 10. Count two is equal to count two plus one. So I created another counter. I just called this guy count two. So inside the for loop, I've defined my counter. I've written my Boolean expression. I've changed my counter. It is a pre-check loop, so I will not get into the body of this loop until this guy is true even the very first time. What am I going to do in the body? I'm going to do C out, count two, and del. All right. So now the order in which this happens, so we're done with the for loop now, is this part of the for loop happens at the very beginning and only happens once. This is where we're creating our variable. You actually can create more than one variable in here. Eventually, we'll see that. But for right now, our rule of thumb is, this is where we create our variable. Then we have a semicolon. This is where we ask our question. This is the same thing as we had right here. This is the same thing as we had before the while loop here. If this is true, we now execute the body of the for loop. When this execution of the body is done, then we change our counter. So this happens every single time through the loop, but it happens after the loop has run. Okay, so it's kind of like having this thing as the very last line of your for loop. So we're gonna get zero through nine printed out there. There's our zero through nine. Make sense? Now we have one little caveat here, which is gonna be the pro and the con of a for loop. Most of the time it's the pro. 
I'm going to take that line right there. And I'm going to print it out after the for loop and it's going to scream at me. It's going to say, hey, I've never seen a variable named count two. You never defined a variable named count two. So I'm going to come back up here. I'm going to say, oh, I sure did. But this guy right here was defined as part of the for loop syntax. So it belonged to this new temporary, what's called variable scope that only existed as long as this for loop was living. So as long as that for loop was spinning, we had access to a variable called count two. But as soon as that for loop stopped spinning and ended, and I get to this line, I've never heard of it. Yep, so I'm going to do that. So I'm going to say, you know what? I'm not going to utilize that first part of the for loop. I'm going to go ahead and just define my variable there. Or I can do this. I can define the variable there, and then I can set it equal to zero initially here. What this now does is it is now defined. It's brought into existence outside the for loop, before the for loop. So I can use it inside the for loop because all variables resolve to their most local definition. When I go to do something with count two here, it's going to first check that temporary variable scope associated with the for loop. And it's going to say, I don't see a variable that was locally defined as part of this for loop called count two. No problem, because I still have some other places to check. So it's going to go one more level up and it's going to say, ah, I see that in the previous scope that I still have access to, but it just wasn't the most local scope where I checked first. In the previous scope, I had a variable called count two that I can set to a value here, do stuff with, make changes to it, print it out. But after this for loop is done, that variable count two survived because it was not something that was born inside of the for loop. It was just used inside the for loop. So now this guy will be, behave just like our while loop behaved. So there's our 10. And to kind of answer your question, let's say I made this guy a 44 here. So when I first define count two, I just randomly put a 44 in there. As soon as I get into this for loop, I overwrote that 44 with a zero. The output's going to be the same. You might say, oh, well, so after this for loop's done, does it revert to the 44? It was only a 44 for one line of code. As soon as we got here, we didn't change some copy of count two to a zero. Variables resolve to their most local definition. The most local definition here of count two is not local to the for loop. It's from the guy right above. Make some sense? So this will still print out our 10, not our 44. Um, Go ahead. Well, oh, oh, I understand what you're saying. So he's asking this if I decide to use it in here. Can I do that? Right? Oh, oh, oh. Well, at that point, you wouldn't even say it in here. Oh, no. I mean, if you remember a couple minutes ago, I left that blank. Okay. Yeah, that's perfectly legit what I just okay. did there. I'm just choosing not to use this functionality of the for loop syntax. I still have to have a semicolon. Because the for loop syntax says stuff followed by semicolon followed by stuff followed by semicolon followed by stuff. I can choose not to put stuff in there, 
but I still need the semicolons. Yeah, this is the actual count too. Okay. Yeah, I think we're, we're gonna when we're talking about passing stuff, we're really you're asking stuff about pass by reference versus pass by value, and we'll 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 talk about that when we get to functions unrelated to what we're at now. Yeah. Um, but but the reality is is that we aren't working with a copy because when we say count two equals zero here, if you want to think about this like um. Oh, so this idea of a variable scope, let's just go ahead and get it into the, the notes because it's important and it's something we're going to reference for, for years. Variable scope. This is where do I have access to my variables? All right. Now what you can do is you can kind of think of variable scopes kind of like a house. When your program first starts up, you are standing in your house, all right? So if somebody says, go and look for something, you're gonna look in the house, anywhere in the house, right? Now, if you now move into your bedroom, now you have a more local environment in which you might search for stuff, all right? So if you're looking for your car keys and you're in your bedroom, the first place you might look is around your bedroom. That's the most local scope to you, is your bedroom. In this example here, this for loop would be like your bedroom. You've told me to find something called count two. So I'm first gonna look around the bedroom here and I'm gonna come up empty because I never created a variable inside of this most local scope, that for loop called count two. So there does not exist a copy of count two in this bedroom, in this scope. Instead, I'm gonna say, I don't see it anywhere here. I don't see anything called count two. But instead of giving up hope and screaming that it's an error, I'm gonna say, wait a minute. There's a little bit, there's more of the house to check. I'll then leave this local scope, leave the bedroom and go to my next level that I have access to, which is the stuff that's outside of the bedroom. This global environment here, the stuff that's inside this opening and closing curly brace, you could even have a generalistic concept in your head that anytime you see an opening and closing curly brace, there's likely a fresh variable scope. That's not entirely a true statement. In fact, it's not true with while loops. Um, but I think if you at least start your, your, your conceptual understanding of this off with that, you can probably make, you, you probably be right most of the time. Main, so all functions have their own scope, for loops have them, their own scope. Um, those are the places we see curly braces right now with the exception of a while loop and an if statement. Go ahead. Yeah, so if I say void, even though we haven't talked about functions yet, so don't worry about this. And I say int count two is equal to four up here. And then I do that. So I see count two defined higher up in my program than this. But this count two belong to, since I defined it right here, it belongs to the variable scope that temporarily exists when this function gets called. So it lives and dies with that function. So even though I have it written up here, when I come down here and I say, hey, set count two equal to zero, C is gonna say, I've never heard of count two. Really it's for two different reasons. Right now, I never even called my do something function. So if I, want to throw that out the window, I'll go ahead and just call it here, do something does nothing other than define a variable and then end. That's what this function currently does. It creates a variable called count two, sets it equal to four, and then dies. The useless function, but it does exist. 
So in this particular case, this variable count to did get created and then it went away. So we can say it's a true statement to say that after that line of code, there was a variable named count to that did have a value of four that then disappeared on me because that function ended. So now when I get to this line right here and I'm just trying to set count to equal to zero, we're going to check the for loops environment first, our bedroom, not going to find it there. We're going to go up one level to our next. We can think of in my example here, this is our house. Everything between the opening and closing curly braces of Maine. That's our house. And we're not going to find a variable defined in there called count to. So it's going to say, look, I've never heard of that dude. This is a problem. Count to was not declared in this scope. That makes sense. Now, I can go all the way up to the most global environment. Now I have count to available throughout my entire program. Anything in this file has access to count to. Now it's cool with it. I checked my room, I checked the house, I checked the yard, <laughs> the place where the house was built. And you know what? Found the keys in the yard. That makes sense. A good rule of thumb would be, and you, you, you this is something you would see in like uh, programming textbooks is, we would call this guy a global variable. It's, acts, it's accessible anywhere within this program. Typically we would say global variables are a bad idea. That doesn't mean that there's never a good use for a global variable, but it's not fair to say that, oh, I like global variables because I don't get error messages. If you make everything global so you have access to it everywhere, all of a sudden the compiler stops screaming at you and you think that life is better. Okay. When the reality is, is you should define your variables in the scope where you need them and make sure that they die off when you no longer need them rather than just put everything in the yard and say look okay i'm I, you know I, I need to brush my teeth well it's not in the bathroom it's not in the bedroom it's not in the house you run down to the yard to find your toothbrush all right doesn't make sense but hey you do you right? <laughs> you know that that type of thing so we would say that this is a bad idea giving ourselves a global variable that's accessible everywhere but we did just see it technically works this is going to scream at me again because it's never heard of a variable called count two so the the correct thing to do a very 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 high percentage of the time when dealing with for loops is to define our counting variable as part of the for loop, which then makes this an illegal line. Because when I get to that line there, it's going to say, I've never heard of a variable called count to. And that's okay. You are going to have to solve the problem and say, if I really, really, really need access to count to outside the for loop, then I need to make that caveat and I need to define it outside of the for loop and then i can give it its initial value in that for loop now i've given myself access to it but only if i need access to it i've created this example here where i'm forcing myself to pretend like i want to have access to it but i would say in practice it's not that common go ahead Uh, it's not that everything works outside of main all programs begin and end with main so when you first run your program when I hit this run button here it's calling the first part of main. But there is a variable environment that lives more global than main. yeah it's only variables yeah yeah you know, I can't I can't put a line of code I can't do. Um, yeah here I think what you're asking is effectively this. Can't do that. Yeah. I can't have code that tries to execute out in the middle of nowhere. I can remember crap out here. 
Yeah, so I can, my variables have more, we have more spaces where we can hide things to remember, but we can only execute code inside of functions where everything starts with main. Yeah. Yeah, I just had one that do something one and we'll get to that. So don't pretend like you didn't see the function thing for right now. That was just to explain the the answer. So but you probably noticed that that do something function I wrote looked a whole lot like this dude. But this dude has to be called main because that's something that came from the C programming language. All programs start begin and end with main. When I hit run, when I start a C program, it automatically looks for your function called main, all lowercase. That's where it goes. It starts there, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> that's, that's where it starts. So if you want it to go someplace else, your very first line in main needs to tell it to go to that other place. All right. But now the reality here is, is if I really needed access to count two here, I could write it like this. But I would say that this is, in terms of common uses of for loops, I would say that's pretty rare. Most of the time, this counter variable in here is kind of a throwaway variable. The for loop lends itself to problems where we are um, uh, doing something some known number of times. I want to do something 10 times, 20 times, 30 times, whatever it is. Okay. Um, that being said, that counter itself really isn't important outside of that for loop. We only used it to keep track of how many times we're doing it. And after we were done doing it that many times, the fact that that variable goes away is actually a benefit for us. It was a throwaway variable. We don't intend to use it later on in our program. And what's nice about that is I can now create a second for loop that happens to count, operate off of count, or count two in this case. And this is a brand new variable called count two that lives and dies with this for loop. Okay, I didn't dig this guy back up. This guy disappeared as soon as this for loop ended. So this is a brand new variable called count two that lives and dies with this for loop. So for loops end up being very self-contained, which is usually a good thing for us because we don't want to have variables that we're no longer using just floating around out there. Okay. One thing is, is that's a bad use of memory. But another thing is, is that it also then takes away your ability to create a variable later on with that same name. That's why in general, when you see a for loop, you're probably seeing it written like for int i is equal to zero, i is less than 10, i is equal to i plus one. Something like that. So I is a common throwaway counter variable for for loops. It's nice and short, easy to write. Our counter here doesn't have much meaning other than just do something some number of times. You can have loops inside of loops. So I can say for int j is equal to zero, j is less than 10, j is equal to j plus one. and then do something like that. I have access to both J and I inside of there. J, its most local definition is right here. I, we look in here, we don't find it. We look one level up, we do find it. So this line of code will execute 100 times. For every one time through this loop, we'll go through 10 times in this loop. There's my 
100 lines of code for i and j. So this would be called a nested for loop. We don't have real good uses for these based on what we know yet. We will when we start looking at two-dimensional arrays. But for us right now, this is more of a parlor trick. We don't have great uses for a loop inside of a loop yet, but they do exist. And the reason I'm showing it to you like this is I'm gonna go ahead and even create another loop. something like that. So now this will do it a thousand times. You probably will very, 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 very rarely see a for loop inside of a for loop inside of a for loop inside of a for loop. Three levels down is about the most you'd ever see. And even then it's gonna be pretty rare because like I said, even just a minute ago, right now with our level of complexity that we're solving problems with, we don't have a use for anything more than a single level loop. When do we need a loop inside of a loop? Whenever we're working with a grid, a two-dimensional grid. When do we need a loop inside of a loop inside of a loop? Whenever we're working with a cube. So if we are dealing with an X and Y coordinate system, that's a loop instead of a loop. If we're dealing with an X, Y, and a Z coordinate system, it's a loop inside of a loop inside of a loop. Outside of that, our brain gets into a knot. Because now we're adding another dimension like time or something like something like that to the equation human beings we kind of max out around three dimensions right and after that things get all squirrely what's this you want to test that test around? all right but again this is just for an example right now you will not be writing anything with multiple loops inside of loops for a while and even you may never well, at some point, you'll probably have some sort of parlor trick where you'll have loops like this. But um, realistically, you'll only ever have a loop inside of a loop. Okay. But the reason I showed this is these throwaway variables, the common naming convention for throwaway variables is typically I, J, and K. Nothing says they have to be that because you saw up here I used count to as the name of my variable. Before that, you saw I used count as the name of my variable. But if you were looking at code in the wild, given this knowledge that, okay, for loops lend themselves to counting type problems, chances are that this dude is very much a throwaway variable that we're just using to count from one number to another number. And after this loop is done, I don't really have a use for that. Having a nice short variable name is easy to type, easy to remember, yada, yada, yada. And because it's gonna go away at the end of this loop anyways, it's not a big deal. I tends to be our go-to move for our starting counter for a, a for loop that sits by itself. If you have a loop inside of a loop, your secondary choice is J, a loop inside of a loop inside of a loop, your tertiary choice is K. Naming convention only. C doesn't care what you call it. All right. But generally speaking for us, if we're operating in what is our world, what does our world look like 99 plus percent of the time? If you're writing a for loop, it's going to look something like that. Create a loop built around a counter that starts at some value keeps going as long as this is true, and that value gets changed at the end of each iteration through that loop. That will get you through programming for 99 plus percent of your career. That one generic loop, do something some number of times. Okay, uh, questions about any of that? All right. Is there a 
Uh, yes, because I haven't taught I++ yet. <laughs> yeah, I have to be careful about that because typically you see this, I++ for adding one to it. Um, but for right now, I haven't taught that yet because it is something that's important because there is a difference between I++ and plus plus I. They operate differently. So kind of the, the again thing is, chances are when I'm asking you to solve a problem, I want you to solve it with the tools of the, in your toolbox that I've given you. There's probably a good reason for that. And there's probably also a better way of solving a problem than what I've given you so far. So I'm kind of asking you to act like MacGyver from that show where you know, you're know you locked in a garage and you need to somehow come up with a way of flying across a mountain. You're building an airplane with whatever you find laying around the garage. If you've never seen the show MacGyver, that's what the whole show is about, basically. He's in some sticky situation with very few resources around and he has to invent something with only what's laying around around him. Yeah, in every single uh, episode, you know, because there was a whole uh, uh, couple of series uh, episodes on um, uh, Mythbusters where they were trying to see if the stuff that uh, the guy, uh, James Dean, Ander Dean Anderson was the guy in the original MacGyver, see if the stuff he invented would, would actually work. And I'm pretty sure everybody died in the airplane uh, that he made out of the garage parts. Yeah, that wouldn't have worked, I think, is, is what the punchline was. That's right. Which was the better show. But only SG1. Atlantis was okay. All right, so homework. Well, first of all, I want to show you one thing. We, I think we've looked at it, but just in case just so you have the tool here. I'm gonna say int a is equal to five divided by two. Int b is equal to five mod two. Okay, notice here, that the division operator works for integer division. Five divided by two, two goes into five two times, right? But, and then a little, right? So really five divided by two is two point something. But notice here that we got the answer that it's just the two because this is integer division. We have another operator here called modulus. This gives us, this goes back to third grade math, long division. So five divided by two using long division is two remainder one. So this guy here gives us the remainder of integer division. This guy here gives us the whole number of integer division. All right, Does that makes sense. You'll need that for your You'll need that mentality for your homework assignment. All right, so for your homework, write a program that loops through all of the numbers between one and 10,000. Your program should print all of the should print to the screen all of the values between one and ten thousand that are evenly divided by three, fourteen, and thirty five. And evenly divisible means you divide it by, if, if you divide it by three, it has no remainder. You divide it by 14, it has no remainder. You divide it by 35, it has no remainder. It has to be true that it's, I only want you to print out the values that are evenly divisible by all of these. Evenly divisible by this and evenly divisible by this and evenly divisible by this. You're gonna write a loop. You're going to ask a question. You're going to formulate a Boolean expression that's going to involve some ants. Submit a link to your code. 
Notice here, you can click on share up here and it gives you a link to your code. Give me that link to your code that's uh, working or close to working, let's say. Submit the self assessment. There's a, for, a format for that on Blackboard. Um, I have you submit that with all your programming assignments because you might spend time on this, not getting anything to work. I want you to tell me about your experience so I can give you partial credit for what you, the time you did spend, the effort you spent, because you might not have much to show for it. This one you should be okay, but hopefully you're challenged enough. It gives the remainder. Okay. So five mod two, it would be a zero or one, but if I did something um, here, five mod four. Yeah. Four goes into five one time, yeah. right? With a remainder of one. Yeah. Okay, but the possible remainder, so if I do uh, 33 mod four, the possible remainders would be zero, one, two, or three when I divide something by four. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. Do uh, always do the next class. So do Tuesday. Yep. Yeah, you want me to put this on uh, Slack? Yep, have a good one.